In 2020, the Cultural Research Center at the Arizona Christian University did a study regarding what it is that people believe. And when it comes to Christians, or I should say professing Christians, there was one statistic that was honestly shocking. According to the survey, 52% of professing Christians believe in works-based salvation. A majority of Christians, or those professing to be Christians, believe they can earn their salvation. That is scary to me. Why? Well, in one, those people who are depending upon their own works are in deep, deep trouble. Second, this also tells me that churches are failing to teach the truth. They're failing. Well, this morning, we're going to look at what Scripture actually says when it comes to salvation. Go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Galatians chapter 3. Verses 10 through 14. Now, this is a letter written by Paul to the Christians in the church at Galatia. He's trying to remind them of the reality that they, in many ways, have forgotten. The reality that the true gospel matters. They had begun to lose some sight of sound doctrine and deviated into falsehoods. And that's a problem we see in the church today. This letter is relevant today. But in these verses of chapter 3, I did say 3, correct? Yes. For some reason, I was thinking 2 in my head. I don't Chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, in those verses, Paul's going to remind us of the truth of the gospel. Before I read this text, let's pray. Heavenly Father, this word is your word to us, and I pray that as we read this word, you will open up our hearts and our ears and our minds to what you are telling us, that we will hear your message And I pray that the reading of this word will honor and bless you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul writes, beginning in verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is, who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now, the first thing that we're going to see in verse 10 is this. We are all under the curse of our own sin. We are all under the curse of our own sin. That's a reality the world does not like to hear, but it is a reality. We are all guilty. And he says here, for all who rely on the works of the law, are under a curse. Now, what is he referring to here by the law? The law here he has in mind is the law in the Old Testament. We can simply say the Old Testament, or you could say the Mosaic law, but the Old Testament law. So that is what he's referring here, referring to here. Now, how does the, work, how does the law work? 
The law in Israel, under the, under the theocracy that Israel lived under, worked this way. If you obey, you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. Seems pretty simple. The solution is this. Obey the word of God. Obey the law, and you're going to be just fine. That's really not why the law was given. But the law worked in such a way that if you obey it, you're blessed. You disobey, you're cursed. So why did God, did, did God give the law? Really, there were two related purposes. First, by giving the law, God showed Israel and the world the absolute unattainable standard of God. Let me repeat. The absolute unattainable standard standard of God. God says, you want to try to be righteous? You want to try to be holy? You want to try to be perfect on your own? Fine. Here's a law. Obey it. Oh, by the way, you can't. It's impossible. So the, the law shows us the high standard that God has. It also shows us that we fall short, way short of God's standard. It shows us that we sin constantly. It shows us that we are guilty. It is a mirror revealing to us our own depravity. That's a word we don't like to associate with ourselves too often. Depraved, wretched, but that's exactly who we are when we stand before a holy and righteous God if we're simply depending upon ourselves. So what's going on? God says, you want to be righteous on your own? Fine, obey this. You can't do it. And so because you sin, you are guilty. 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 And so you are under a curse. Back in the Garden of Eden, God looked at man and said, you sin, you die. What did man do? Sin. God warned us, if we sin, we die. And we sin anyway. And each one of us, on a daily basis, continues to sin all the time. Oh, we are under this curse. None of us are righteous. In fact, it says in Psalm 14.3 and Psalm 53.3 that none is righteous. No, not one. Not you, not me. On our own, we are guilty and cursed. What does it mean to be cursed? It means to be under divine judgment. That's the standard of the law. And if we depend upon the law, depend upon our works to save us, that is the result. They show our guilt and reveal that we're under this curse. Obeying the rules won't do any good. You can't earn your way to God's good graces. Because if you try, your works simply reveal your guilt. Now, some may say, I'm not that bad. I don't do things that are absolutely horrible. I'm okay. Or some may even deny their own sin. Well, again, it's God's standard. So let's look at some of the things the law points to and see if we really are all that good. Ever said or thought, OMG? And I don't just mean the letters, I mean what it stands for. That's blasphemy. Ever lusted after somebody in your mind? Jesus said that's adultery. Committed adultery in your heart. Is there somebody in this world that you hate? If you hate someone, Jesus says you've committed murder in your heart. 
ever said something dishonest? Oh, husbands, we've done this, I'm sure. Wife asked a question. We all heard the lighthearted phrase, does this make me look fat? Or how about this one? It's a little more common. Do you like this food that I have made? Oh, yes, honey, it's delicious. I love it. That's called lying. So if we have done any of these things, just one, guilty, guilty before God. Doing these things makes us a blasphemer, an adulterer at heart, a murderer at heart, and a liar. And by the way, under the law, none of these things are worthy of being saved. People who do these things are condemned to death. That's God's standard. And if we have even thought something unholy or unrighteous or sinful, we're just as guilty as someone who's committed it by their actions. Why? Because that is how high God's standard is. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Verse 10. It's interesting that he says this. Abide by all things and do them. Do what? All things things. All of it. 100%, which means one mistake, one sin, one failure. You have not done it all. And if you have not done it all, you are guilty of breaking all of it. And we've seen that in James, which we've been going through, James. That is the standard. So everybody is guilty Everybody is under the curse of their own sin. And in verse 11, verses 11 and 12, it doesn't get any better. I hate to tell you, it does not get any better. In verses 11 and 12, we see this. We can't undo the curse through our own works. We can't undo that curse through the things that we do. It's impossible. What's he say? Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Now I want to stop there. What does it mean to be justified? To be justified means to be rendered innocent. Nobody is rendered innocent before God by the law. In other words, your works aren't going to save you. They're not. It doesn't matter if you've committed one sin and then done a thousand good deeds. They will not render you innocent. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. Obeying the rules cannot make us innocent. We cannot overcome our guilt with good works. Why? Isaiah even said that our own good works are like filthy rags. Why? Because they're contaminated by our guilty nature and our own sin. Ever done a good deed and then realize, hey, I did that so I can save some money on my taxes? There's a little bit of selfishness in there. So even the good things we do are tainted by our own guilt. You may have heard this phrase, karma. Anybody here ever heard of karma? Yeah. Karma's a myth. I hate to tell you, it's a myth created by a false religion. And I have heard this phrase, Christian karma. That's a heresy. There is no such thing as Christian karma. Instead, it's God's word. and God's standard. But we cannot earn it. We can't say, well, God will weigh at cosmic scales and say, hmm, you've done more good than bad, so you come on. No, it doesn't work that way. But God's standard is absolute perfection. For those who are mechanically inclined, 
If you have a car engine it's running a little rough, kind of dirty inside, needs some oil, so you open up a bottle of oil, pour that, pour that fresh new oil in there, guess what happens to that fresh new oil? It's now dirty. It's dirty. It may not be as dirty as it was, but it's not 100% pure anymore. For those who are mathematically inclined, think about it this way. God says, if you want to graduate, we'll use that as an illustration, if you want to graduate, that is, be saved, here's what you have to do. You have to have an average of 100%, not 99, not 99.99999, not 99, no, 100%. Okay. So you're going through life and you end up failing one test. Oops. Got a failing grade on your report card. Well, you decide, guess what? I'm just going to ace everything else and it'll be good enough. No, the standard is 100%. I don't care how many nines you have after the 99. That is not 100. It is still short of 100. It is impossible to have a 100 average if you have anything less than 100 on your report card. And by the way, before God, our report cards aren't full of 100, 100, 98, 97. No, they're full of this. F, 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 F. Fail. We cannot overcome our curse by our works. Why? He says here in verse 11, the righteous shall live by faith. The standard, the way to overcome it is by faith. But the law, verse 12, but the law is not faith. So if you're depending upon your own works to save you, if you're saying, God will look at the things that I've done and I'll be okay because of it, then you are depending upon the law and the law is not faith. And I have bad news. If you're depending upon your own works, your own goodness, the things that you do, you will go to hell. The world doesn't want to hear that. But it's the truth. No one is justified by the law. And the law is not faith. Rather, he says at the end of verse 12, the one who does them, that is the law, or the works, the one who does them shall live by them. In other words, if you're going to say, God, look at the things that I've done. God will say, okay, you really want that standard? You got it. You're guilty. No hope at all. Now, it may seem strange on an Easter Sunday to hear this depressing, dark news. But I have good news. Verse 13. Christ. Christ. And what we're going to see in verse 13 and 14 is this. Although we cannot break the curse of our own sin, Jesus did break that curse for every believer. Jesus broke the curse for every believer. If you have repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, that curse is broken for you. If you have not done that yet, you have a chance to do it today. You have a chance to do it today. And if you do, that curse will be broken for you. What does he say? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. I want to stop there for a moment because we have this theological term, redeemed. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to be rescued from death. Rescued from death. Christ rescued from death. You could say that's what redeemed means. Christ rescued from death. Who did he rescue from death? Us. Who are the us here? The us are the believers. Christ rescued the believers, because he's writing to the believers in Galatia. Christ rescued the believers from the curse of the law. But how did he do it? By becoming a curse for us. By becoming a curse for us. Now, there's a theological term for what's going on here. 
First, what's going on? Jesus willingly came down. God the Son willingly came down, humbled himself, even to the point of death, death on a cross. And Isaiah 53 says that our guilt, our sin, our wretchedness, our depravity was placed upon him. That is, it was credited to him. And Jesus died the death that we owe. He died the death that we owe. He did it in our place. We call that substitutionary. God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus shed his blood. Sin is forgiven. And in 1 John 2, the apostle writes that Jesus is a propitiation. That is, he satisfied the justice and wrath of God. Jesus did that voluntarily. Our guilt, our sin was placed upon him on that cross, satisfying God's justice, God's wrath, and bringing forgiveness to all those who repent and put their faith in Jesus. We call this substitutionary atonement. That's the theological term. That is what Jesus did. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there at all. Part of the substitutionary atonement is those who believe in Jesus, Jesus' righteousness, his holiness, his perfection is credited to us. It's not our righteousness. It's not our goodness. It's his credited to us. We are the beneficiaries of his work, of what he has done. And the way we receive this is by faith alone. By the way, the crediting of Jesus' righteousness to us is called imputed righteousness. A fancy theological term. Y'all learned some theology this morning. But it is Jesus taking our place, and we receive from him as an act of grace alone the righteousness of God. And we receive it by faith alone. You will hear me say, if you come more often, terms such as sola fide, faith alone. By God's grace alone, through Jesus Christ alone. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who was hanged on a tree so that in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come. Now, quick summary on the blessing of Abraham. Paul's including a whole lot here, so I want to explain this. The blessing of Abraham is simply this. God went to Abraham and said this. You'll have a blood heir. That's, by the way, it's a singular blood heir. That blood heir is Christ Jesus himself. You will have a blood heir through whom people from all over the world, Jew and Gentile, will receive a blessing. That blessing is this. Being in God's ultimate promised land, that is the new heaven and new earth. Being in God's glory forever. You could summarize it this way, salvation. That is the blessing of Abraham. And it says in Genesis that Abraham was credited as righteous, not because of his works, but because of his faith. So we receive this blessing through faith in that promised Seed that promised heir, Christ Jesus. So that, he says, the blessed, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Now he's talking primarily to Jews. And I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, Jews and Gentiles here. So Gentiles and Jews who believe in Jesus receive this blessing so that we might receive the promised spirit. And this is the Holy Spirit. By the way, if you hear somebody online or on TV say that a Christian needs to receive the Holy Spirit later on, no, that's not how it works. The Holy Spirit isn't some thing or some entity that you receive later on. No, every believer receives the Holy Spirit. When? At salvation. Want proof for that? 
Paul says that in, in Ephesians, that it is the Holy Spirit who seals our salvation. That can't happen if we haven't received the Holy Spirit when we're saved. We receive the Holy Spirit when we're saved. But he's saying here that in Christ Jesus, we receive the blessing of Abraham and the Holy Spirit, last two words, through faith. Through faith. Not works, not effort, not the law. Faith. So the final question is this. What do we do? How do we be saved? The answer is simple. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. That is how a person is saved. Repent of your sins, that is, turn away from them and turn toward God. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. That is how a person is saved, not by our own efforts. So today, this morning, I must ask, have you repented of your sins? I pray that you have, and if you have not, I pray that you will today. You don't have tomorrow guaranteed to, to you. Any plans you've made for after the service may not happen. But you have right now. Today is the day to repent and be saved. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. If you have never repented and put your faith in Jesus, do it today. If you are a believer, you're not exempt from this. I'm not exempt from this. We also must repent of our sins because we still sin. And we must, as he said earlier in verse 11, live by faith. In other words, if we claim it, we must live it. So if you are not, it's time to repent and start living in faith. Whatever your need is, whether it's for salvation or spiritual renewal as a believer, today, repent.